um, is that we have what I feel is a chronic uh, overreaction in some areas and a chronic underreaction in, in other areas. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, specifically talking about some of the, the over, overreaction, you know, uh, we have a rather uh, disturbing uh, headline here that everybody's going to be wanting to talk about and is, is going to be concerned about, which is the, 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 the situation with the stock market. So, you know, this is from CNN Business, you know, right. U.S. stocks plummet on coronavirus fears. Uh, yeah, that's over 2,000 folks today, yeah. Another, so, another bad day on Wall Street. Yeah. So, you know, we've got, uh, says, uh, markets plummeted Monday over cor coronavirus fears. The Dow had its worst day since 2008. 2008 is a dirty word to me. Uh, tumbling more than 2,000 points after a trading halt and the biggest oil crash in nearly 30 years. And, and I, I want to point out also the things that they emphasize in these articles. Um, the media is not your friend. Uh, they are going to make this story as bad as they possibly can. Uh, global oil markets plunged after the implosion of an alliance between OPEC and Russia caused the worst one-day crash in crude prices in nearly 30 years. And I do love the fact that um, Saudi Arabia and Russia, in the middle of all this, uh, can't just get their act together and, and not create a oil war in the middle of all this, when apparently oil is probably going to be a much lower demand, uh, probably as a result of coronavirus. Um, yeah, it, it's nice to see that these these governments can't get their act together and never will. So, I mean, that's just, I guess, the way it is. And it says your European and Asian markets closed lower as well. So um, this is something that a lot of people are concerned about. I'm very concerned about it uh, simply because I, I do actually uh, use a 457 uh, to supplement my own income. And uh, I can see the losses, the daily losses that are occurring on, on, on my account. Um, so that that's a case where I would say we're having, I think, a massive overreaction uh, to Corona, uh, where, where the stocks are, are plummeting uh, like this. Again, I don't think Saudi Arabia and Russia are helping the situation. I think they made it worse uh, with their little oil war that they're having right now. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, I, I think we're, we're looking at a, at a huge overreaction there because it, it comes down to uncertainty. Um, people don't really know what's going to happen. And so then you get a kind of a sense of panic uh, that happens because people are not sure what's going on. And that's, I think, where the government can have can have a really positive role uh, in, in providing good information and things like that. But right now, people don't feel like they're getting good information. You know, I'll, I'll give you a good example of this. And, and I think that this is a this is a fair point to make uh, when you talk about masks right now, the government says, well, you don't need masks. Masks aren't important. And, and that's what that is, is basically kind of a half truth. Uh, you, masks aren't going to necessarily help you in your day to day life as you're walking around town and things like that. That's not where the masks are really going to help you. But but they're very important if you become sick. Now, and why is you, that? Because you're you were a first responder. Why would the masks not help you as you're walking around? It's not that they won't necessarily help you. Uh, mm -hmm. the, well, well, the issue in particular with Corona is that the particulate of Corona is too small, even for an N95 mask. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's something that that they've that this is something that the scientists are saying. This is through testing and all that. They're saying the, the the coronavirus is small enough that it can pass through the N95 mask. So wow, I thought the N95 was like the professional one that kept you safe. No, I mean that's that's that no, that's not true because the N95 mask is is basically it's your industrial mask. It's it's the mask that's most commonly used. Um, you know, in a large scale to protect people, but but where do you see uh, N95 masks uh, sold in 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 large in large bulk? It's at Home Depot and Lowe's. You know what I mean? Th those are the places that sell in N95 masks and have been selling them for a long time. If you go to uh, Walgreens, yes, they'll they'll have some. They, well, not right now they won't, but they used to have some N95 masks, but they sell a lot of the surgical masks. Now, the value, the real value of both of those masks, okay, is in people that are already sick. And it, it can help uh, when, they're, when they're coughing and they're sneezing and all that kind of stuff. And it can help them from spreading the illness. So what I'm trying to say is when it comes to the mask, the, the masks are a, a good part of your emergency kit and, and kind of an essential one, in particular, if you live with anyone, because if, if that person that you live with becomes sick, 
you're going to want to have that mask for them and yourself mm -hmm. uh, because it does reduce when, in other words, it's reduced, it's most effective when both the caregiver and the person being cared for both are wearing the masks. Uh, generally, you'd put a surgical mask on the person who's sick and you'd put an N95 mask on yourself, you know what I mean, as a caregiver. And that's going to reduce the chances because you're both wearing masks, it's going to reduce the chance of you transferring it. And of course, you also want to wear gloves. One thing I think is funny is like my local Walgreens down the street, uh, I've been looking and, and there's no masks available, but but gloves are still available. And I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, well, why aren't people buying gloves and masks? If, if you're so concerned about this and, and you're going ahead and you're buying a mask, why aren't you buying gloves? You're much more likely to get this, uh, get sick because you touched something and then touched your face. And, and that's all over the place. That's That's everywhere. Everybody's saying that. But people don't seem to get it because I don't see people running around with, with gloves on. They'll wear masks, but but gloves, that's too much. That's that, that's weird, you know? <laughs> that, yeah. That's extreme. You know, I'm not going to wear gloves out in public. I'll, I'll wear a mask, but I'm not going to wear gloves. Um, but the gloves are probably actually going to be more effective. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to say is is with, with masks, they are effective in terms of psychology because they keep you from touching your face. As long as you're not scratching your nose and breaking the seal and things like that, they, they can help because you're, not, you're going to be more conscious about touching your face. And when it comes to not touching your face, you know, a, a cloth mask will, be, will do just as good as a surgical mask or an N95 mask in keeping you from touching your face. Uh, in fact, that during the Spanish flu, that's all they had. And there's all sorts of images of police officers and all sorts of people. There, there's all sorts of images from, from the Spanish flu of 1918 where you see people wearing those cloth masks. In fact, my understanding is... Uh, that's one of the reasons that it became so popular in Asia is because in Japan, they started giving everybody masks during the Spanish flu of 1918. Mm -hmm. That's how it kind of got ingrained in the culture. That's why you see a lot of Asian countries where they do wear the masks. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I just think it's, it, it, again, it's a half truth. And that's the problem is, is when people see those half truths, uh, they start to lose faith in their government. Because uh, instead of the government saying, hey, We've got a real shortage of masks, and this is really the good uses of them. So if you're not going to use them for this or that, uh, please don't buy them. You know what I mean? Uh, right. it, it's a good thing to have, again, because if you get sick, uh, you should definitely have one on if you have to leave your house. You shouldn't really be leaving your house if you're sick, but if you are, you have to because some people are going to, especially if they live alone. And uh, the fact of the matter is uh, most of the people that get this, um, they're talking 80%. 80% of the people that get this will have only mild symptoms. That's 80%. That's, that's, that's mm -hmm. data coming out of China where, where we have the biggest outbreak, where we have the most data. So they're, they're saying 80% of the people that get this are going to have mild symptoms. Now, now, now yeah. And, and one of the things um, that I also find interesting is uh, when you talk about experts and they're, they're, they're talking about what's going on, they're talking about numbers, you have to realize that these numbers are not correct. And the reason they're not correct is because we know that a lot of people that get this do not become systematic. So unless they're in a cluster, they are not going to be tested ever. They're never going to be tested. You're never going to know they have the coronavirus. There are people, I almost guarantee you right now, that have the coronavirus and don't know it. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're treating it like the flu. And they might not even, they might not even have to stop going to work. Uh, they might just be a little off. They might just be feeling a little achy. They might just be feeling a little little touch in the back of the throat, or they might not feel anything at all. Mm -hmm. That's like that's that's the science that we're already being told that this this virus can be asymptomatic. You do not get any symptoms, and how would you know if if, if a healthy person, another uh, a relatively healthy person, gets this? The chances are they might not even get sick. And the issue is that the, they're going to be spreading this. Uh, to the more vulnerable populations. And that's where I want to get to the underreaction. As I'm talking about a little bit of the overreaction, the underreaction, I think, is that we are trying to spread this very wide net mm -hmm. uh, as, if, as if the entire population is going, to, is going to die from this, which is just not true. When the truth is that we have vulnerable populations, people with compromised immune systems, older people, people over 50 is what we're looking at right now as far as the data that I've seen. People over 50 are, are much more affected by this. By the way, great news is that uh, children seem to be very under affected by this, which is great news. 
Uh, but but older people and people with compromised immune systems are at, at risk. So so my thing is instead of putting this wide net out and and putting millions and millions of people into quarantine like we're seeing in Italy, which right. I think is going to be a disaster. We'll, you know, we'll see if that works or not, but I think that's well, going to be a disaster. I, I um, think that's an admission by the government that they're completely overwhelmed. They don't know what to do. All they can do is put the entire country under quarantine. They're canceling soccer games. They're, uh, what does it even mean to put the entire country under quarantine? I guess it means they close the borders. Um, which well, I, I, I read an article where they talked about it's not exactly what you might think, uh, and that's and that's also why I say this this is this is the overreaction that's ineffective because mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're closing things like gyms, uh, public swimming pools, uh, they're canceling sporting events, they're they're, they're canceling large scale events. It's not as if you can't leave your home. They're just telling you they're recommending that you you not leave your home. If if you engage in some of these activities, you can be arrested and fined. You know what I mean? So these are essentially going to become black market activities. You know, if you if you want to have a public soccer match, that's going to be a, a black market activity. Um, but 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 it's uh, they didn't close things. Obviously, they didn't even close things like restaurants, for instance. Restaurants, uh, the last I heard, are still open. Uh, if you go to a restaurant, you're supposed to have something like a five, like a five feet square around you. You know what I mean? Of, of no contact with other people, which. I don't know exactly how that works with your server and all that kind of stuff. It's it, it, it gets to sound silly. The logistics of it are silly. And I brought this up last week. Um, the, the, the reason China is able to do what they're able to do is because they have two things the rest of the world doesn't have. They have both capability and will. Okay. And what I mean by that is capability comes in the fact that they have logist the logistical ability and the wealth to implement things like this. And when I say will, it's because they are a tyrannical regime that can basically do whatever they want. It's a police state. Uh, I brought up that there's uh, there's this situation that they have there where it, the, 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 there was a um, there's an RN that I follow, and, I, and I'll put a link to his uh, YouTube uh, when I when I edit these on YouTube. I'll put a link to his to his channel. But he talks about he has a he he he's a uh, RN educator, so he goes around the world and and teaches other other RNs how to be RNs. And he has some connections in China, and he talked about an email he got from Boots on the Ground where someone described what it's like to go buy groceries in a quarantined area in China. Now, first of all, they can indeed go out and buy groceries. Mm -hmm. So what happens is they have three checkpoints at least. They have one checkpoint when they leave their apartment building, which is the party official. And I mentioned this last week. I didn't realize there's a party official living in their apartment building if you're in China. Apparently there is. There's a there's a, a there is a political officer, if you will, uh, that's that lives in your building, and they have enlisted this person to be your the first line of defense. He's sitting out there at the door with a with a thermometer uh, that we I assume you probably in your ear or forehead, and he takes your temperature. Then you will have at least one police checkpoint that you're going to hit, and then the the supermarket itself will hit you, which means you're going to be tested three times. You know, three times going, three times coming back. Uh, it's obviously a highly redundant system. Uh, I think in part because China is notoriously corrupt, so they need a redundant system. So <laughs> that's the way that works. Um, you couldn't do that anywhere else. You just couldn't do it. For once, for one thing, there is no party official living in your building uh, in most most countries. You know, uh, that that just doesn't happen. Uh, so that 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 link isn't even there. Um, so I, I think it's unrealistic to think those kind of protocols can be uh, implemented anywhere else. But what yeah. you can do, what you can do is take your limited resources, and I'm talking about your first responders. At some point, I'm sure that the military will become more involved. The military is heavily involved right now with quarantine. Uh, when we talk about quarantining people from these cruise ships or flights, they end up on a military base. That's where they're quarantined. So the military is already involved with this. Is that happening in the United States? Yes, that's that's uh, the cruise ship that uh, was stopped outside of San wow. Francisco. That's where those people are going to end up. They're going to end up on hmm. military bases um, to, to, to do their 14-day quarantine. That's their mandatory quarantine is 14 days. So th they're going to be on military bases. And this, already, this has already happened with other uh, people involved with, with travel. That the military has been active in doing this. But what my, my point is the, the military, law enforcement, fire, all your first responders are of, of a limited quantity. And they themselves can get sick. And once they themselves get sick, they will spread the sickness. 
So you have to focus there, focus there, focus on your first responders, uh, make sure that they have uh, proper equipment, proper procedures. That includes procedures for, for dealing with them being sick. You know, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of first responders will work sick. It's part of their mentality and, and they, they don't think a whole lot about it. In this case, it's a, it, it can be a death sentence to someone. Absolutely. So, so but, but, but specifically what, what, I, and what, I wanna, uh, what I'm trying to emphasize is we need to look at vulnerable populations. Stop this idea that if you're healthy, that you're going to die from this and you need to stockpile toilet paper. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. what we need to do is focus our attention and our resources on the vulnerable populations. Again, those are people with compromised immune systems and older people. Uh, over 50, the, 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 more, the, the more over 50 you are, the more at risk you are. So the thing is, you, you have to look at those vulnerable populations. I mean, the outbreak in, um, in Washington happened at a nursing home. Uh, and, and that really gets to me because I have a father, an elderly father in a nursing home. Mm-hmm. And that's the place that needs to be protected. That's the place that we need to have some safeguards. That's the place where we should be focusing our efforts. Hospitals, we should be focusing our efforts because hospitals could become a breeding ground for this, ironically. You know, uh, you don't necessarily want to go to the doctor right now if you're sick, honestly. Unless you're chronically ill, you want to just stay home and self-quarantine and, and first of all, not infect other people. But also, you don't want to infect the doctor's office, the, the, the urgent care office. You don't want to infect the hospital. And we're not talking about these things because we're not talking about people will still have the same health problems they had before when corona is, is, is raging. And instead of, of this idea that, that healthy people need to need to do this and do that and take all these resources, it's just to me, it's, it's just asinine. It, it, it's just asinine. And it's not logistically possible. So focus on the vulnerable populations, focus on institutions, focus on hospitals, nursing homes, prisons. Those are the places where we need procedures and our first responders need to have procedures now in place that say, what are we going to do with our sick people? What are we going to do? How are we going to determine how sick they are that we're not going to let them work? What are we going to do with them? You know what I mean? Are we going to quarantine them? Why isn't that um, happening? Why, why don't we have these procedures in place? I think it's because people are just putting their head in the sand. I mean, I, I really think that they, 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 there's, again, I think that there's a chronic issue of overreaction and underreaction and nothing in between. And, and it goes back to one of the reasons that we're doing this show, which is this sort of this, this binary political thinking. You know, I'm not talking about gender here. I'm talking about binary thinking when it comes to politics yeah. and everything is yes and no and right and wrong. And there's nothing in between. And that's, and you guess, guess what? The truth is with our, with the way things are right now, with our, with our binary political system, our binary culture, as, as it were, everything, you know, both sides are very often wrong. <laughs> both sides are very often wrong. And so- to, to kind of yeah. make it a little more concrete, because you know I'm not from that world. I'm not a first responder, so it's a little hard for me to grasp this. Would the city council or the mayor or who, in your ideal world, if we had a more nuanced policy, who would be making this policy? How would that? What would that look like? How would that happen, Eric? Well, in, in a federal system like our own, the the ideal situation is that the federal government is providing guidelines, mm-hmm. and then they're implemented at, at the smallest level possible. And that's what's going to happen regardless, because, again, we're, we talk about logistic capabilities when it comes to uh, trucks, uh, personnel, all that stuff. The only thing that the federal government really has at its disposal are the military. OK, that, that, that's all they've got. That, that's it. The uniform services, uh, which also include, uh, you know, the health services. There's a uniform service as well. People forget about that's that. That's a really good point, uh, because, you know, the, all these agencies uh, whether it's the ATF or ICE, when you look at the actual number of agents, we're talking thousands, not tens, not hundreds of thousands, certainly not millions. And you know, this is not the kind of problem that can be solved by a few dozen or hundred or even a few thousand people responding. Yes. And, and the other issue, of course, is that your, your typical uh, first responder locally, which is a poli- you know, police, uh, fire, EMS, um, they, they work in an environment that doesn't include this issue going on. So th- they're not necessarily, don't have necessarily have the numbers uh, where they can actually uh, respond uh, to these kinds of situations adequately on their own. 
Uh, that's why you have things like CERT, for instance, what the, uh, the, the fire department has, which is a, a civilian uh, auxiliary, essentially, that the, mm. the fire department has, uh, which, is, which, was, uh, which is a fascinating history, by the way, because uh, this actually started in L.A., and then it was, it was a program that they liked, and then it was adopted nationally. Uh, but, but, but I'm not hearing anything about, for instance, the fire department saying, Hey, we got to get our cert people ready. You know what I mean? Uh, we got to make sure they got some PPE. We got to make sure that they're, they're ready to go. Uh, you know, uh, here in, in Maricopa County, we always had a very strong posse, for instance, with our, with our sheriff's department and, um, uh, back in the sheriff Joe days. Yes. No, this, this predates sheriff Joe. I oh, mean, this okay. is something we had that, that we had uh, for a very long time. Um, and, under under the current regime with uh, Penzone, uh, the 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 posse has been decimated, and not and by the way, I don't I don't fault them for that because a mm -hmm. lot of what happened was they found out that a lot of the posse members were not properly certified, and I don't fault him for for saying that. Okay, well, this is this is unacceptable. You know what I mean? Uh, okay. But but at the same time, uh, uh, organizations like that are very helpful in a crisis like this. But again, with first responders, you have to have procedures in place to deal with people being sick and think of it in a way that we don't think of it typically, because again, I will tell you in the culture, people will go to work sick. It's not, it's not an atypical kind of thing. And they won't even necessarily wear a mask and they have access to masks. You know what I mean? Because they don't necessarily want to call attention to themselves. Right. So, because uh, that was one of the things um, that, 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 that I noticed a lot was for instance, if we had somebody with tuberculosis, that's an air, airborne, airborne disease, right? And you realize they had tuberculosis. One of the first things you do is you put a mask on them. You don't necessarily everybody doesn't put a mask on themselves. But they put a mask on the patient, you know, and that's something that's 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 very 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 typical. And and you're talking about an airborne virus there that can be very serious. So you're you're you know that that that's the proper procedure. But the issue is, again, when you're talking about your first responders, um, they have to be able to to understand. Um, they have to be able to understand that they need to have procedures in place that are different than the typical when it comes to their own people being sick, because they're going to be the method of trans transmission if we're not careful. That's kind of the last thing I want to say about that. Okay. Well, that's, that's a lot of good. That's a lot of good information. Um, uh, you know, you, you started about uh, with the, with the topic of you know coronavirus versus liberty. That that these crises are really hurting our, our freedoms, but it seems to me that it's it's not the crisis so much, but the fact that we absolutely lose our minds and we're not able to coordinate uh, in, a, in a sensible way um, when these things happen. We just don't know how to respond. And so the easiest thing to do is to overreact. Absolutely, but, but I will say, I also think there's underreaction. And like I said, that, the, the, that's the example I give with the the, the public safety and, 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 you know, they have to deal with that and they're not, and right now I don't think they are. I really just don't think they are. All right.